Welcome to Uppsala, all people from outside Uppsala, either it's domestic or international, but um, this weather outside here reminds me of a quote by Lawrence Darrell, the older I get, the more I become a Mediterranean man. So, <laughs> so now I set the stage. Uh, I will talk, my talk will be on um, pandemics and inevitable inevitable consequence of human predatory behavior because I believe that pandemics are just a consequence of, of our way to behave. Uh, here are a few examples of emerging infectious outbreaks since 2000. I forgot seek. I realized, thank you Anders for reminding me. Um, you can read yourself and I just quoted a couple of them. You see that we talked about a little bit about the bird flu in in um, 2003, and the bird flu was uh, s a sort of a, a strange virus, the H5N virus. It was a consequence of the poultry raising or the poultry farming. Uh, it was a high pathogenic virus with very few cases uh, among people, mostly in poultry. Um, and um, um, then we have the swine flu, 2009, started in Mexico but the extremely low fatality rate and the, compared to other pandemics only 55,000 died during the pandemic um, and now the, the swine flu is in a post-pandemic phase with very low mortality of course a high morbidity but low mortality and then we have this MERS uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus is a SARS-like virus, a cousin to SARS, you can say, uh, circulating in camels or camel-like animals, um, and also infecting people. But uh, we don't hear very much about SARS uh, or about MERS today in, in Sweden. We don't r read much about it. Of course, when we have a small outbreak, we can have a small quote somewhere about it. But no big big issues. Uh, one thing that I want to stress is the bird flu, H7N9, in China. It started in 2003, uh, 2013, um, where we have today counted up to seven, more than 700 cases and a fertility rate of 35%. And this virus is very strange because this virus is a low pathogenic virus. It's not a high path virus. It's a low pathogenic virus, so it's flying under our radar all the time. And when it's causing cases, <clears throat> so the, the, when it starts to, to uh, give cases, the mortality rate is extremely high. And this is one of the viruses we should really look close into. And of course, Ebola, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia in uh, 2013, an unprecedented ca <clears throat> 28,000 cases, 11,000 deaths. And the question is, why did we have this enormous eruption of cases in Western Africa? One, I mean, if, if you compare to the other outbreaks of Ebola we have had in Central Africa, they've been more restricted to villages, out in, more often in remote areas. But when Ebola became urban, um, everything just erupted. So uh, this was an extremely good example of what, ha what can happen in urban areas when a virus that's usually constrained to, to rainforest go into, travel into town. And today we have this ongoing outbreak of plague in Madagascar. We didn't, th I mean, how many think, uh, thought of getting back plague again? Of course, plague have circulated all, uh, all the time since the Black Death, but uh, we, never he we never, never hear about it, we never read about it. But right now we have this big outbreak of plague, and it's also an urban plague, which is making the situation much worse. And further, um, the ongoing rapid spread of antibiotic resistance. This is also an er a very emerging situation where we have spread of antibiotic resistant genes among bacterial communities, including our own. Uh, let me focus a little bit on flu because 
uh, we can't talk about all these emerging pathogens, so I have to concentrate on one. And flu is the, the most obvious, I think, because if we, if we want to look into or estimate the risk of what's going to be the next big pandemic or the next big outbreak, I guess it's going to be an RNA virus, it's going to be a respiratory virus, and the most possible candidate is flu. And flu is uh, a virus that is with its natural reservoirs in waterfowl, wild waterfowl. And uh, this is virus is causing a mild um, gastrointestinal infection in the ducks or the, the, the gulls. But it's also a very promiscuous virus. So when we we're, we're pushing the borders closer to each other with domestic animals, wild animals, and also humans, the virus can make this journey from one host to another. So it's a multi-host pathogen. Uh, and as you can see, humans, pigs, poultry, it can also infect whales and dolphins, horses. Uh, and um, and all these viruses circulating in the duck population, they are all low pathogenic viruses. These are the viruses we should look at more carefully because these are the viruses that can cause the next pandemic. I don't believe in the high path virus that can cause pandemics. I believe that they can very likely cause outbreaks or singleton cases, but not big pandemics. They're too odd. And just as a reminder, the Spanish flu, during this 20th century, we encountered three big pandemics. And the first one, the, the mother of all pandemics, uh, as we used to say, is the Spanish flu in 1918. More than 50 million people died. Um, and the, 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 the distribution of this mor morbidity was not evenly distributed over the world. It was more, um, it was as one of the researchers quoted, it was better to be a healthy American than a poor Indian. Because in India, there were at least 15 million deaths of, of the Spanish flu. The same virus, uh, the same virus actually came back in 1957. It's like a car. If you build a car and then you put on some new uh, lights and steering wheels and stuff like that, so the same virus came back in the new form in 1957 with a, it was a resortant virus, a new virus with new genes coming in. And then it caused the, the uh, Asian flu with four million deaths. And later on, the same virus came back again with a new, up, a new setting of genes as the Hong Kong flu. And many of us sitting here today have also met the Hong Kong flu in its sort, sort of um, uh, seasonal influenza variant because this is the virus that we have which is the pre predominant virus circulating today in, uh, in the world. so why do we have uh, new uh, emerging infections well this is i think this is the infection arena actually so we have 7 billion people today and we are increasing we have 7.3 billion people today um, there are more than 100 billion or approximately 100 billion domestic animals. And that is also increasing because of our high demand of meat. And we can just think of what, what if we were all vegetarians? What would happen? Maybe we shouldn't have flu pandemics, at least. And also ecosystem changes, um, major ecosystem changes right now. Uh, it's not just that we are taking over ecosystems, we're also changing them. We are creating more and more monocultures. So today we are the, the second most common animal on Earth. Just that number by the rats. I guess. And then I lump the, the black and brown rat, brown rat together. Um, another thing is that biodiversity is decreasing. We are... Um, it's, today, it's an unprecedented extinction of, of different animals in different ecosystems, like frogs, for example. They are, in many parts of the world, they're gone. Um, and one thing is also that the, the, the urban population is not as it was before, more evenly distributed in, in the areas where we live. We are becoming more and more urban, so we're moving into town. This is one of the main reasons why 
if we are struck by a pandemic or a new emerging outbreak, why it can hit us so hard. So I think that human history will be even more become urban history in the future. Here's another driver, habitat, habitat destruction, expanded farming and animal husbandry, human crowding, of course, and movement of humans into wildlife domains, as we can see, for example, in the, in the Ebola uh, crisis we had in Western Africa, as a good example. We're also trading exotic animals across the globe. This is just numbers from the, from, the US, uh, from the CDC. Four million birds, reptiles, primates, and the illegal trade is absolutely unknown. We have no idea, but it's big, it's huge. And this, this can, of course, be health risks, definitely. And also that biodiversity is going down. I think biodiversity, ecosystem with a high biodiversity can act as buffer zones from sort of buffer zones for different pathogens to move from one ecosystem into the next, into the next, into humans, for example. And vice versa, of course, because we must also realize that since we are so common on Earth today, we have created our own ecosystems, the urban ecosystems, and these can sort of swipe back to, to, back to nature again. And there are exam examples of, of viruses that have sort of struck back to, to big apes and big mon and monkeys, gorillas and chimpanzees in Central Afri Africa, paramyxovirus, for example, have infected from humans to the apes with the consequences. So, my last slide, the population explosion is actually the coin with two sides. And the side we usually talk about is climate change, environmental degradation and loss of biodiversity. But we must also realize that this coin had another side, and that's emerging, re-emerging diseases and pandemics in the end. Thank you. Här finns det gamla gunade blad. Jag letade efter 14 december 1918. För då ska det finnas en bra sammanfattning av Spanska sjukans härjningar hösten 1918 i Kalmar stad och dess omnejd. Sedan den 1 september har till dags datum i Spanska sjukan med dess följdsjukdomar inom Kalmar stad avlidit ett 60-tal personer, mestadels ungdom och personer i sin kraftigaste ålder. Och vi bodde ju på Slottsgatan och så kyrkogården ligger ju precis bakom. Och kyrkogården var som en upplöjd potatisåker. De hade inte skottat igen. Vad tror du att det här berodde på? Var, var kom den här spanska sjukan från? Från utlandet. Sjömännen drog hem det till Borgholm. Sjuka sjömän. De kunde vara friska på morgonen. Och... Jag är jättesjuka på kvällen och så kunde de gå in två, tre dagar. Så var de döda. Tror du att det kan komma en ny epidemi som spanska ja, sjuka? Ja, Du tror det kan komma någonting nytt? Det tror jag. Det tror jag blir mycket värre. Det var faktiskt en av de last sort of survivors of the Spanish flu. We interviewed them 10 years ago uh, as a project together with Stefan Hildebrand, somewhere around. Um, and uh, this film is under production. And um, many of these, I mean, they were horrified, horrible stories they told us about people in their uh, class. This one died, this one died, that one died, and so on. It just continued. And uh, these people are gone. Today, so they can't. The only thing we, where we can get the source is by reading today, and also by this film. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, there would be microphones out in the audience. Can you wave with the microphones if you have short 
questions um, for the people speaking up here. You can just raise your hand, you're gonna get the microphone. Meanwhile, when you, when you look at this, uh, Bjorn, is there, is there a, a way to turn this around at all? Oh yes, there are. Um, uh, there are many ways to turn it around, and I think Peter will talk about a little bit more about that later on. And uh, I think that the most important right now, that first to acknowledge that we have these threats, and secondly, I think it's important to do much more of, of um, 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 surveillance. We have to sur make surveillance and censuses, not just in the human population, because when it hits the human population, it's already too late. We must do it much, much earlier, out in the wild or in the peri-urban areas, and look for different viruses, different emerging pathogens, because it's there we're going to find them. We can't, we can't create a healthcare system taking care of the pandemics when it hits us. Then it's too late. I mean, it's going to be an extreme stressor on the healthcare system and also on the society. So I think it's much better to do it much earlier to, to have some sort of best guess because there are infections out there oh, yeah, sort of there waiting are. for us. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is not the last one. I, the, the swine flu is definitely not the last uh, flu pandemic we've ever seen. But, but we are going to grow in numbers anyway. I yep. mean, the population is growing. Yep. Um, there are less and less species on Earth. Um, mm. We're gonna have, gonna be tied to animals. Do you think behavioral change uh, is possible? I'm, I, I'm not a pessimist. I think I'm a realist, and I think behavior What's change. What's the difference? <laughs> well, yeah. well, today it's very hard to tell the difference. But uh, I think the no, I don't think um, behavioral changes are enough. No, definitely not. And I, I don't think, of course, we can have behavioral changes when it comes to how to tackle this uh, this infection. Because now we acknowledge that. We have to look in a much broader perspective, in a One Health perspective. That was impossible, let's say, 15 years ago. So things have happened oh, yeah, in this area. Absolutely. But it's uh, average, average use behavior. That, I'm not sure that we're going to change that. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that today mm. anyway. W were there questions or short comments in the audience? I don't see. Not for now. Okay, okay. good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.